VOA1, The Hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Mario Ritter Jr. and Brian Lynn. Later, Steve Ember will present our American history series, The Making of a Nation. But first... The Australian Koala Foundation says Australia has lost about 30% of its koalas over the past three years. The non-profit group says drought, wildfires, and development projects played a part in the drop in the koala population. They are urging the government to do more to protect the creature's environment. The group estimated the koala population has dropped to less than 58,000 this year from more than 80,000 in 2018. The biggest decrease was in the state of New South Wales, where the numbers have dropped by 41%. Deborah Tabert leads the Australian Koala Foundation. She called the drop quite dramatic. Only one area in the study was estimated to have more than 5,000 koalas. Some areas were estimated to have as few as 5 or 10. Tabert said the country needs a koala protection law. She added, What we're concerned about is places like western New South Wales, where the drought over the last 10 years has just had this cumulative effect. River systems completely dry for years, river red gum plants, which are the lifeblood of koalas, dead. The loss in New South Wales likely sped up after large forest areas were destroyed by wildfires in late 2019 and early 2020. But some of those areas already had no koalas. Land clearing by property developers and road builders has also destroyed the koala's environment. I think everyone gets it. We've got to change. But if those bulldozers keep working, then I really fear for the koalas, Tabert said. Scientists studying the genetic material of Japanese people say that three ancient populations were ancestors of modern Japanese rather than two. The research was published last week. It suggests that the genetic ancestry of modern Japanese is more complex than experts had thought. The researchers studied the genetic information of 17 ancient Japanese people. They took deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA, from the bones of 12 ancient people for the study. They also used earlier information from five other individuals. They then compared the DNA to that of modern Japanese people. The research confirmed that there were two ancient groups of people in Japan. The first was an early group of hunter-gatherers. 
they first appeared between 20,000 and 15,000 years ago during what is called the Jomon period. The second group is estimated to have first come from northeastern Asia about 3,000 years ago. That group is believed to have brought modern rice farming methods to Japan during what is called the Yayoi period. The researchers said these two groups are thought to be the main genetic ancestors of modern Japanese people. But the researchers said they found that 71% of modern Japanese genetic ancestry comes from a third population that arrived about 1,700 years ago. The people of this period, known as the Kofun, are believed to have brought cultural ideas such as centralized leadership. These migrants had an ancestry similar to Han people in modern China. Shigeki Nakagome was one of the leaders of the research published in Science Advances. He is with Trinity College, Dublin, in Ireland. He said, We are very excited about our finds on the tripartite structure of the Japanese populations. He said the findings were important because they used the study of ancient genetic material to rewrite the origins of modern Japanese. Daniel Bradley is a co-leader of the research and is also with Trinity College, Dublin. He said the ancient DNA showed ancestry in a way that could not be seen using modern genetic material. The Kofun period is named for the large burial places made of earth that the people then built for their rulers. During that period, important technologies were arriving from China by passing through the Korean peninsula. Chinese characters started to be used in this period, such as Chinese characters inscribed on metal implements, for example, swords, Nakagome said. Scientists use the word implement to describe early weapons, such as swords. Japan is an island nation that includes thousands of islands. Its geography made migration in ancient times difficult. The first people are believed to have reached Japan when world sea levels were lower, more than 30,000 years ago. The researchers said the genetics of Japan's population have not changed very much since the Kofun period, which lasted about 400 years. I'm Mario Ritter, Jr., the American Space Agency, NASA, has chosen the moon landing site for a new ice-seeking explorer set to arrive in 2023. The explorer, or rover, will be sent to an area on the moon's south pole called Nobile Crater. The robotic vehicle is called Volatile's Investigating Polar Exploration Rover, or VIPER. VIPER's purpose will be to map and explore the region's surface and subsurface for water and other resources, 
NASA said in a recent announcement. Nobile Crater was formed through a crash with a space object. Viper measures 1.5 meters by 1.5 meters by 2.5 meters. It weighs 430 kilograms. Unlike the rovers used on Mars, Viper can be piloted nearly in real time, because the distance from Earth is much shorter. Viper is solar powered and comes with a 50-hour battery that was built to withstand extreme temperatures. It was designed with the ability to walk sideways, so that its solar equipment can stay pointed toward the sun. The mission is part of NASA's Artemis program, which aims to land the first woman and next man on the moon by 2024. The program's long-term goal is to establish a continued human presence on the moon. NASA says it will be the first mission to explore the surface of the moon's south pole. This is one of the coldest areas in our solar system. So far, it has only been studied by orbiters and satellites observing the moon. Data collected from those observations led scientists to believe that ice and other resources likely exist in areas near the moon's poles. Some of these areas remain permanently blocked from the sun. NASA says such areas can reach temperatures as low as minus 248 degrees Celsius. Scientists believe the South Pole's frozen water could date back billions of years. Lori Glaze is the director of NASA's Planetary Science Division. She told reporters, "The rover is going to get up close and personal with the lunar soil, even drilling several feet down." NASA says the search for ice on the moon is important because it is seen as a necessary resource for future exploration activities. Astronauts could use the ice for drinking water and to cool equipment, or make rocket fuel for missions deeper into the solar system. NASA says it chose a mountainous area on the western edge of the Nobile Crater for the landing, because it contains many nearby sites of scientific interest. It also has surface areas that the rover can effectively explore. Daniel Andrews is overseeing the Viper project. He said in a statement that years of study had gone into examining the polar area the rover will explore. Viper is going into uncharted territory. Informed by science, to test hypotheses and reveal critical information for future human space exploration. NASA hopes the data and samples that Viper collects will help scientists find other places where water might exist on the Moon. The mission also aims to help NASA better understand how frozen water first reached the moon, and how it was able to survive for billions of years. I'm Brian Lynn. <laughs>
from VOA Learning English. Welcome to the Making of a Nation. I'm Steve Ember. In November of 1840, the American people elected William Henry Harrison as their ninth president. Harrison was a retired general and a well-known Indian fighter. Many people considered him a hero for his victory over Native Americans at the Battle of Tippecanoe in 1811. Americans elected John Tyler as Harrison's vice president. The two men ran on the campaign slogan, Tippecanoe and Tyler too. Harrison was the first president from the Whig Party. Some Whig leaders, including Senators Henry Clay and Daniel Webster, believed they could control the newly elected president. Harrison asked Daniel Webster to edit the speech he planned to give after the swearing-in ceremonies. Webster removed some material from the inaugural speech and suggested other changes. The inauguration took place on March 4, 1841. It was the coldest inaugural day in the nation's history. Harrison spoke on the front steps of the Capitol building. He gave the longest inaugural address of any president. It lasted almost two hours. But Harrison did not wear a winter overcoat or hat. He got sick, probably from standing so long outside in the cold. Rest was his best treatment. But the new president was so busy, he had little time to rest. Harrison's health grew worse. Late in March 1841, he developed pneumonia. Doctors did everything they could to cure him, but nothing seemed to help. On April 4th, exactly one month after he became president, William Henry Harrison died. Vice President John Tyler was then at his home in Williamsburg, Virginia. Daniel Webster, the new Secretary of State, sent his son on horseback to tell Tyler of the President's death. The Vice President was shocked. He had not even known that Harrison was sick. Two hours after he received the news, Tyler was on his way to Washington. There was some question about Tyler's official duties. Harrison's death marked the first time that a president had died in office. No one was sure what the Constitution meant when it said that the powers of a deceased president should go to the vice president. Eventually, Tyler, Webster, and other cabinet members decided that Tyler should be president and serve until the next election. That was a very controversial claim because people said, no, he's not the president, he's an acting president. He's just temporarily filling the office, but he's not president. Historian Michael Holt taught at the University of Virginia. He says, although not everyone supported John Tyler's claim, he set an important example. He showed how power could transfer peacefully to the vice president after a U.S. president died in office. Tyler was sworn in as the nation's 10th president on April 6, 1841. He was 51 years old. No other man had become president at such an early age. Tyler was a slaveholding southerner. He was born and grew up in the same part of Virginia as William Henry Harrison. 
His father was a wealthy landowner and judge who had been a friend of Thomas Jefferson. Tyler completed studies at the College of William and Mary and became a lawyer. He entered politics and served in the Virginia State Legislature. Then he was elected a member of Congress and later governor of Virginia. He also served as a member of the United States Senate. Tyler believed strongly in the rights of the states. As a congressman and a senator, he had voted against every attempt to give more power to the federal government. In fact, historian Michael Holt says that in many ways, Tyler was more like a member of the Democrats, the opposing party at the time. He favored the typical position of Democrats on what we could call domestic policy, which is that government is best which governs least. The, the less federal domestic policy you have trying to generate economic growth or improve society or whatever, the better. In comparison, many Whig Party members firmly supported the ideas of a national bank, a protective tax on imports, and federal spending to improve transportation in the states. Tyler was just as firmly against these ideas. At the same time, many Democrats did not like the president either. Most Democrats regarded him as a traitor who had jumped from the Jackson party and joined the Whigs, however temporarily. Michael Holt says even Tyler's appearance made him seem difficult and unpleasant. You look at this guy and he's sort of aesthetically thin and, and with sunken cheeks and a long pointed nose. He just looks like he's unhappy with the world. <laughs> President Tyler quickly became even more unpopular over the issue of a new national bank. He wanted to establish such a bank in the nation's capital, Washington, D.C. The national bank could open offices in a state, but only if the state approved. Tyler's proposal was not the kind of bank most Whigs in Congress supported. They wanted no limits of any kind on the power of a national bank to open offices anywhere in the country. Whigs in Congress suggested a compromise. Bank offices would be permitted in any state where the state legislature did not immediately refuse permission. But President Tyler vetoed the compromise. He sent the bank bill back to Congress. The congressman wrote another bill. They said it was exactly what the president wanted. But the president did not agree. He said the states must have the right to approve or reject bank offices. He said this second bill would also be vetoed unless changes were made in it. The changes were not made, and Tyler did as he said he would do. He vetoed it. The decision created a crisis in the cabinet. All the president's advisors but one, Daniel Webster, resigned. Michael Holt says that several days later, most cabinet members and a large group of other Whig congressmen voted to expel Tyler from the party. They read this paper saying he's no Whig. Don't blame us for all of his vetoes. Harrison appointed a new cabinet of Whigs he hoped would be more friendly to him but after a while, they too resigned. Michael Holt says 
Tyler made more changes in his cabinet than any other U.S. president. President Tyler struggled with his party over other issues. One was about import taxes. Two years into Tyler's presidency, the government found itself short of money. It was spending more than it had. Congress decided that import taxes should be raised, some even higher than 20%. But President Tyler vetoed the bill. He said it was wrong to raise the tax so high and, at the same time, continue to give the states money from land sales. He said the federal government itself needed the land sale money. Michael Holt says once again the Whigs were angry. Their party controlled both houses of Congress and the White House, but they could not reach their goals. The Whigs were elected with this agenda that they wanted Congress to pass, that they had promised would rescue the country from a very serious depression, and this included a new national bank, higher tariffs, distribution of federal revenues from public land sales. President Tyler, he adds, frustrated the entire Whig legislative program. It was clear the Whigs would not nominate him for the next election. So Tyler turned his attention to the Democrats. He hoped they would ask him to be their presidential candidate in 1844. Tyler began appointing Democratic advisors to his cabinet, and he gave his support to one of the Democrats' causes, making Texas a state in the Union. Texas was an independent nation at the time. Some Americans wanted to bring Texas into the United States to further expand the country. But others were afraid that the territory would permit slavery. They wanted to keep an equal balance between slaveholding and non-slaveholding states. President Tyler had the opposite fear. Michael Holt explains that Tyler was afraid that Texas would remain an independent republic and abolish slavery there. He and other Southerners thought that that was a terrible idea. But he also believed that this is what's going to put him in the history books, that he's going to be responsible for adding this enormous republic of Texas, although it wasn't quite as big as what they claimed, to the United States. I'm Steve Ember, inviting you to join us next time for The Making of a Nation, American History from VOA Learning English. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson.